Which Knowles are you most excited to talk about amongst all the new players? You are Locked On Seminoles, your daily podcast on the Florida State Seminoles. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Welcome back into Locked On Seminoles. I am your host, Brian Smith. Thank you for making this your first listen each and every day. Truly appreciate you stopping in to talk some Noles football with me. Today's show is a live show. So those of you that watch it live, thank you for coming in. And those of you who watch it as a recording, I also appreciate you stopping in to talk some Noles football. But here's the concept that I want to talk about first, and then we'll get into the coaching. The young players for Florida State, this is the key. The Noles have a ton of young guys that are starting to get into the lineup, whether it's as a starter or it's a player that's at least rotating in. The following is just off the top of my head, but here are the things that I enjoy watching as somebody that's an analyst and likes to compare teams around the country. Number one, obviously you got Brock Glenn at quarterback. Makes it a little easier because he has the football in his hand before the ball is distributed. Each and every play, the Knowles have offense. However, the defense is where it's been prior to Brock coming into the game against Clemson. You've got Conrad Hussey. You've got K.J. Kirkland. You've got Edwin Joseph. That secondary has got a chance. And there's also some sophomores that are starting to make noise closer to the line of scrimmage, Nicholson in particular, that I think have a chance to be really good players. Not sure about D-line yet. That's kind of, you know, the, the difficult spot. Bigger body guys, linemen, usually got to take your third year. But K.J. Sampson is one of those guys that I think can be really, really good. He's just, you know, he's fighting through a lot of inexperienced players. We'll see how that goes. I'm not too worried about him getting a chance to, to make an impact. He's a kid out of New Bern, North Carolina, a uh, pretty talented football player. Lucas Simmons, um, I'm not sure how many of these guys will, will play right away. But, I mean, Sam Singleton, another running back, they're really good. Obviously got Cam Davis this year, Jabril Rawls. Otto's played some, the offensive lineman. He's probably a little ahead of pace to get in the lineup, but they've got some good players there. And by the way, Quindarius Jones is, is a really good corner too. So the young players for Florida State is what I want to talk about. Anybody that wants to jump in the chat and talk about it, that's great. I uh, just wanted to give people an opportunity. And again, we'll get to the coaching stuff. I have plenty of comments on that. And for anybody that wants to air their grievance or have a question for me, I'll jump into the chat here in a moment. But first off, again, I, I just want to talk about some of these guys. Number one, let's start with Brock. Just from my experience, this is my expertise with analyzing players as quarterback based on stats. Here's the number that I've talked about many times, and I will repeat it now. Do not forget this. It is super, super consistent with very few exceptions. At least, at least 400 passes into your career is where the light kind of goes on. What do I mean by that? It's one thing to throw a crossing route against man coverage and hit a guy with a dime. Okay, big deal. Seventh, eighth, ninth graders that I that I get a scout in seven on seven tournaments can do that. Can you read zone, get the football, they change defenses in the middle of the play, and you have a massive guy coming at you. Read the defense, keep your eyes downfield, still make the throw while you're getting blasted. That is football at the quarterback position. And I see that a little bit already with Brock. Like he's maybe even too much, enjoys the physicality of the game. Remember the fourth and nine play against Clemson? That play did not start out well, like many others. Got a guy right on his tail. He gets away. He goes upfield, has a chance to either throw or run. He says, to heck with it, I'm taking off. And he gets hit far before he gets the nine yards, and he grinds it out, gets the football over the yards of game mark, first down Knowles. He's a gamer. Now, that's not the exact same scenario I just talked about, but again, he didn't have any chance to throw. The pass protection on that play was terrible, like it is far too often with Florida State, and he found a way to make it happen. There are post-snap reads in the traditional sense. You read the coverage, you make the throw. Then there are post-snap reads where you got to run for your life and just make it happen on the fly. He's already proving that he understands the art. The science takes longer. That's fine. But he's also made reads where he threw the ball down the field. He made the correct read, like the bomb he threw to Malik. Unfortunately, that was called back on a penalty. Throw and catch is as good as you're going to see this year. That's what you're looking for. When a guy that's in his first year of truly getting a chance to play, I mean, he's a redshirt freshman, has that opportunity and he connects, 
that gives you some hope for the future. Now let's talk a little bit about Brock's frame. He's got the size, 6'2", 215. He's got a pretty darn good arm. It's gotten stronger since when I saw him a couple years ago at Elite 11 out in California. And he's also a guy that, again, isn't afraid to use it. On the run to throw, pull up. Oh, there's nothing there. I'll take off. He uses his physical traits the way they should be used. I won't know for a long time when neither will anybody else how much is progressing. With post-snap reads, going to have to talk to people. Probably have to see him in a game where a team really is very difficult with what they're doing post-snap. I think most teams are just going to try to take Florida State's receivers away as poorly as they played this year by playing tight coverage and stuff the box because that's what's worked against Florida State. So we may not know till next year, but that's the biggest thing to look out for. Number two here, as far as players that I'm excited about, is Hakeem. I didn't know what was going to happen because he got banged up early. And I'm like, oh, man, not again. He, he got hurt again. Then he comes right back, and he started being a, a focal point for the Florida State Seminoles. He can't teach 6'2", 6'3", 215, and running like a deer. He is a very unique, physically built athlete. Long term, he's got two more years of eligibility. You're talking about a guy that can go down the field and make big plays, but he can also take, like he did, he had one of these in the game against Clemson, a basic screen right at the line of scrimmage, run through one guy after he ran around another. He got eight yards out of nothing. The best teams have players that create plays that has zero, and I mean zero, to do with the schematics. My guy is better than your guy. That's it. Hakeem has that kind of physical ability. As far as the receivers go, I'm excited about Will Wayne, Elijah, and all these guys they just brought in. They, they've got a really good group. The freshman class at receiver is really, really good. Obviously, the two tight ends are exciting. I, don't have, I mean, that's the given. I'm, I could have went with them off the bat, but everybody's seen what they can do already in Amari and Landon. They've got two future, future NFL tight ends. It's bizarre to have two talented tight ends like that at any school at any time in college football. We could be going through a historic run here with the Knowles at tight end. Hey, if you shift to a little more one back, two tight end offense because of those guys, I'm cool with it. They just got to block a little better. But the receiver group with the tight ends is good. And then you get to the backfield. You got Makai Danzig, who's played a little bit. You got Cam Davis. You got Sam Singleton. The young guys, they look pretty good to me. And to be honest with you, I'm not surprised they look good, but they seem to kind of fit into the offense. Let me give you an example. Makai had a bomb thrown to him. They can use him on screens, wheel routes, et cetera. He's one of the fastest players in college football from the jump. He ran 45-99 in the 400 in high school. That is absolutely unequivocally flying. He's the kind of guy that could put up the football cleats and pick up the track spikes and try to go get a sponsorship. He's that kind of speed but he wants to play football. They can use him in ways that other teams can only imagine, and you cannot simulate that in practice. So once he has a full tilt understanding of the offense, the Kai Danzi, especially when you got Cam or Sam or somebody in the, in the backfield, put him in the slot. Who's guarding him? Florida State will have weapons and matchups that are very, very unique. You can run motion, jet sweeps with that kind of player. He doesn't even have to touch the football, kind of like Jalen Lucas before he got banged up, and he impacts what the other team does just by using the fakes and the motions and the sweep motion and all that, it's very difficult. So I like that a lot too. The question I have is the following. They've got some young players that are pretty good in terms of raw talent along the offensive line, but we haven't seen them because they have so many seniors, fifth-year seniors and six-year seniors up front. None of them have really played other than Andre Otto. This is my one not just concern moving forward with Florida State, I am extremely concerned. Going into the next season, let's be honest, 24, this is basically a big practice now for 25. Florida State's not going to have any experience on its offensive line next year. That's really all that significant other than like maybe one guy. Um, and that's if nobody transfers, et cetera, transfers out, like TJ Ferguson, et cetera. That's not good. They've got to, I know this is not what coaches want to hear because they, they want chemistry up front, so do I, but, if they don't play some of these younger guys in significant moments from this point of the season to the end, meaning either they start or they're rotating in, I don't want to hear any complaining from them next year, privately or otherwise, when the O-line doesn't have chemistry in games. Lucas Simmons and these guys, come hell, come high water, must play this year. They got talent. Figure it out. That's it. 
it's not like the O-line is exactly playing well. They're 133rd in the nation, 133rd in running the football. Obviously, the O-line stinks. They got to get younger guys in there some way. I don't know how you do it, but they got to make it happen. Um, I'm not going to go into the specifics of it, but some of these freshmen and sophomores have got to play. They did a terrible job of recruiting from 21 in 20. In 20. The O-line group, it, it's not there, and they're paying for it now. They're going to need, again, at minimum, get two offensive linemen from the portal, probably three. It's terrible for next year, but they still got to have some other guys, too. You need some depth. You need competition, et cetera. So that's the fascinating side of this. When I come back, I'm going to talk a little bit about the defensive side. Then I'll jump into the chat, and we'll go from there. That's next here on Locked on Simmons. My computer is not being friendly. There we go. All right, FanDuel. NFL fans, you can start the season with a big return on FanDuel, America's number one sportsbook. So when you get a hunch on in the middle of the game, you can check out the latest stats, view live play-by-play, and so much more on the same page where you place your bets. You'll get started with $200 in bonus bets guaranteed when you place your first $5 bet with FanDuel. That's FanDuel.com. Let's talk a little bit about defense for Florida State in a more specific point of view here. One of the areas that myself and just about anybody else that covers Florida State has been disappointed with is linebacker recruit. I mentioned Nicholson just a little bit ago. Graham's another young player. They need guys like that to really make an impact moving forward. And they've started to. That's a good, that's a good note. I mentioned KJ Sampson. That's a key player that's going to get a few reps here and there. The D line's been really weird. It's kind of a hodgepodge of great and then terrible. I forget which one is which, but they're 14th and 18th with sacks and tackles for loss. But yet they're one of the worst defenses in the country on third downs. Those two things should not even be remotely congruent. They should be repelling each other like magnets that have the same end of a magnet. It's, it's, it's really weird. I don't understand why that works that way. I don't understand how it's possible, but that's where Florida State's at. So why not get some of the younger guys in, give them a chance? Daniel Lyons is another guy I want to add into that equation. He's a kid out of the greater Miami area. He's played pretty well this year. Uh, he's a redshirt freshman, redshirt sophomore, but he's a guy that I think will start next year. He might be your key guy. Only KJ Sampson up front. That's a good start. That gives you a point that you can say, okay, we've got this. Uh, we got Lamont. We got some other young players coming up on the edge. You're probably going to lose Patrick. You know, you're you're pretty much going to lose your D line in general. Marvin, maybe. Uh, I'm not sure how good Marvin will be down the stretch. He's got a long way to go to decide to turn pro. I can tell you that. But they don't have a lot of experience up front next year at D line either. So I think this is a team that's quite honestly looking for some younger players on that side of the ball in the trenches too down the stretch. I know Florida State's coaches are going to look at this like, we're winning out. That's how you know coaches think. They're not winning out, though. We all know that. If they go through the rest of this season, especially to get down the last couple games, and they're losing again to the point where it's just obvious you're not going to bowl game, they better play the younger players come hell, come high water. Uh, there will be a revolt, I know, on this shows with, with, the, with the live shows, as, as it should be. And there will probably be a lot of fans that are very disappointed otherwise. But at the same time, you got to play these guys because next spring you can't just be green on both offensive and defensive line. Then expect things to go well down the road. Let's jump into the chat here just a little bit. Mike, what's up, brother? What's up, Brian? Go Knowles. Mike, go nuts. Um, I I tell you what, this week uh, is a great week, by the way. I just want to throw this out here. Having the bye week is so important. To get healthy, they're banged up. And to get Brock time and then some of these young players, what we're talking about here today is an opportunity for some guys to kind of get into the discussion at least a little bit and talk about the opportunity to make it happen. Because if they don't play this week into practices, how in the world are they going to be ready to play against Duke, North Carolina, Miami, all the teams they have left? They've got to be ready by practicing this week. And when I say that, 
I mean, with the ones, the the older guys, it's it's a problem, but they got to do a lot of things to make that happen. So, it's it, it's a big deal. You've got to find a way to make that happen. Um, also, when you talk about the Florida State Seminoles this week, the quieter that it is, the better. If you haven't seen, there's I'm not even going to repeat what he did. Colby Young, former Miami player, transferred to Georgia. His football career is pretty much over. Uh, if you don't know what I'm talking about, go look it up. I will not repeat it. Complete idiot. Florida State doesn't need any of that. Uh, make sure when you're recruiting this week, which Florida State will obviously be out on the road recruiting, you recruit better character guys than Colby Young. That's unbelievable. Let's see, Garrett, why haven't we ran the Wildcat this season? That's a good question. I thought they might with Cam or with one of the other guys. You can do it in certain situations. It's not like it's a shocker. I'm a pretty big fan of it against certain defenses, depending on their front, how basic they are, and depending down and distance and where you're at. Go Against goal line, you really need to know what you're doing as the guy that's got the ball because you can get crushed. Um, but in the middle of the field, short yardage, you can really have some fun with that. Even a running back can throw a pot pass off a little – like dives down, then they just throw it over. You can do something like that every once in a while and keep a defense honest from crashing the line and making it happen. It, it's pretty interesting. All right, Reb Mamba. Love your stuff, Brian. I wish you still uh, came on with the Dono talking about flips to Miami go Canes. Yeah, I'm not I'm not going to just go away from the Miami show. I'll go on every now and then if Dono asks me, but I have no idea my schedule day to day, brother. I, I honestly don't. Garrett. Are we better off sticking with Brock and Luke than getting another transfer quarterback? Use that money for a better O-line. This is something I talked about on the show I did earlier today. This is the hardest thing, and I don't have an answer for this. You have to be at practice, literally everyone, all of it, to know the answer to this. You can only speculate. How good are Brock and Luke at picking up the offense? That's really the only question there is. You'll get more chemistry with just reps between now and the end of next summer going into fall camp. They'll have plenty of reps with the receivers. And Florida State has a lot of young guys. Yeah, Brown and all these other guys that are redshirt freshmen, freshmen, sophomores. They're fine at the skill spots. But if you go spend money on a quarterback, hypothetically, that's money out of the kitty that you're taking away from the O-line. I think with as dire as the O-line situation is in terms of experience post 2020, obviously this year's team's experience, there is bad at O-line, which makes no sense. You have to go O-line and just ride with Brock, barring him getting a catastrophe of an injury. That's all I can say. Um, you're going to have a third quarterback come in. If you want to take a quarterback out of the portal that just wants to be there, a grad guy, an extra guy, like somebody that's out of the Ivy League or out of the MAC, that's, a bad, that's fine. But you'll have three scholarship quarterbacks and, you know, you've I think you'll be fine. The question becomes, can you make it happen? Big if. Can you make it happen if you don't get at least two? And I'm guessing three. Not just good, but really good offensive linemen. Next year could be a repeat of this year up front. Because, they're, again, they're going to lose the majority of their guys, and they stink already, like, you're not going to have any chemistry. I mean, they can't be they can't be worse. Surely they can't. But you're not going to have any chemistry. And as I'm going to talk about here in a minute, there needs to be an O line change. Let's get to that right now. Uh, Atkins needs to go. I think everybody needs to understand that. There, there's no friendly here. I was going to wait to after the season, but this is ridiculous. Florida State should never be 133rd in rushing in college football. The offensive line shouldn't be embarrassing week after week in college football. He's got to go. So they're probably going to have a new O-line coach and coordinator. There's so much new that's going to happen with the offense in the offseason. I think you have to spend the money on the O-line and get back to ah, – this is so boring. Get back to basics. You have no choice. Because if not, you're going to be in the same situation where the only team that has a worse rushing offense than you is Kent State. Maybe the worst program in the history of Division One football that is currently operating. Just saying. Malik Stuckey. Funny how Mike brings up Luke every time someone mentions Brock. Leads to, 
leads me to believe they don't trust Brock or two, he's scared Wook might be might bail. A little of both. Here's here's something I've learned forever. Coaches are very thin-skinned. They, they, they can't even imagine something negative being said about them, which is ridiculous. And two, they will lie, lie, and lie to try to get kids to stay. One of the things that's been outed forever is at the end of spring practices, as a, an example, if there's a quarterback race, they never name the leader. Name a school that names a leader between the quarterbacks. Never happens. Why? Because they know the backup will leave. Well, it's gotten to the point now where that's too bad if you do not name so-and-so the leader, the other guys automatically leave anyway. But you can at least try to get them to spring ball by not saying anything through this year. And Luke just got there. I know he likes Florida State. He really liked Mike. I talked to him about it extensively multiple times during tournaments and Elite 11, et cetera, when I'd see Luke. I don't think he's going to transfer. Uh, he's going to stick it out for a while. If he's not playing by his junior year, I'd imagine he'd leave. That's just nature of the beast. But if he doesn't eventually beat Brock out, that's just what you have to expect. If he sticks around, you're you're at a bonus. But most guys are going to transfer. That's just the way it works. So we'll see how that goes. Alpha Papa, the offense can't uh, pass. I don't even know what you're saying here. How is the rushing attack the worst in college football? Well, there's 134 teams and they're ranked 133rd. Out of the FBS in the Power Four, they're dead last. So that's that's out. Garrett, did our staff fail or mellow? Big dude, highly recruited, third year, and he's always on the bench. I don't know what's going on there. I saw him and got to know him a little bit when he was at St. Thomas Aquinas down at Fort Lauderdale. But to be truthful with you, I really don't know what the deal is. I thought Julian Armella would have played by now, and he has. Maybe he's had injuries. There's something else there, but he's a really bright guy. I'm not I'm not sure what it is. That that's a great question because is it a development thing again? I, I'm not sure. It's a problem though, because you can't be in a scenario where your best young offensive linemen aren't getting PT. If they're not making it, and especially as many misses as they've had, that just accentuates the need to go back in the portal. We'll get back into the chat after this on Locked On Simmons. Have you downloaded the Game Time app yet? If you're like me and you like going to see live action, because there's nothing quite like it, seeing a basketball game, a football game, baseball game, boxing match, or even going to a concert or any kind of play or anything else, Game Time's got you covered. All you got to do is download the app, check out what you're looking for by typing it in, finding the event, clicking on it, and you can even see your seat. When you click on it, you can see the venue from that seat, what it looks like. It's really cool. So take the guesswork out of buying tickets with Game Time. Download the app, create an account, and use code Locked On College for twenty dollars off your first purchase. Terms apply. Again, create an account and redeem code L O C K E D O N C O L L E G E for twenty bucks off. Download Game Time today. What time is it? Game Time. All right, let's get back into the chat a little bit here. Um, yeah, the Amarillo comment was really, really interesting, by the way, because I'm not sure what's going on with that. That's really weird. Let's see. Ed says they need to go out and get tackles. Uh, I'll come back to that. I'm glad you mentioned that was my next point about the O-line. So very, very good timing. They have a bunch of guards. If they would have gotten that Indiana guy and kept Bless Harris, it would have helped. Yeah. Here's the deal. There aren't enough tackles in the high school ranks, JUCO ranks, and the transfer portal, if you all dumped them into just the high school level, it wouldn't work. There aren't enough of them. It's not even close to enough. They get hurt. They're not good enough. They can't pass block. They don't understand how to do it, whatever. It's a complex position. So that leads to the following. For the number of teams that need at least one, if not two offensive tackles, and Knowles might need two. I don't, I don't know. We'll find out next spring. Florida State will be lucky to get one. Because there will be at least 30 or 40 other schools going after about five guys. What does that do? That drives up the price. What does that cause a problem with? Florida State is not, and I repeat, not an elite school with NIL. I said elite. They're, they're solid, but they're like Miami competing with them. They're going to lose that almost every single time. Miami's NIL is in another planet. So is Auburn's. 
So is Tennessee's. So is Ohio State's at Texas, at Texas A&M, et cetera. They've got more, they got more money that it's not even competitive. Tackle is a huge problem this year, maybe next year, maybe even after. It might be the biggest problem in the program. So, Ed, you just brought up a really good point, and thank you for doing that. But prove me wrong, unless one of these younger guys, maybe Lucas is ready, I have no idea, but they need younger guys immediately to play this year to prepare because O-line is hard anyway. But being on that edge against a true pass rusher from a Florida, a Miami, a big bowl game against Ohio State, Notre Dame, Texas A&M, whatever, that tackle's on an island, man. That's got to be an elite player. Florida State needs to hit the recruiting world in a much better way to tackle. Fortunately, they're getting a little better with their O-line recruiting based on the current class, but they got a long way to go. Here's another one from Ed. They should have moved their current tackles to guard and filled in the tackle position through the portal. Instead, they went after guards and they really screwed up. Here's where I disagree. They just couldn't get the tackles. It's not that they didn't try. They just didn't get them. Again, what I just said is true. There are maybe four or five, and that number is probably high, of the desirable tackles in the portal. This isn't my information. This is from the people that are getting paid millions of dollars. There are very few tackles that are super high-end guys to begin with. How many of them are going to stick? If you're that good, you just go to the pros or you stick around one more year where you're at, take the NIL where you're at, and just go to the NFL. There just aren't enough of them. That's the problem. Malik Stuckey. Why couldn't we keep Biscuit? Did they really believe 84 was going to be our check down? I don't know what the deal was on the price. I never heard the backstory, but I assume he got more money and got more playing time. That's a great question. This is not a good take. Fire the whole staff, get Missouri's head coach. Missouri's head coach just got his clock cleaned. Uh, they just lost 31 to 10 to AM. I'm not so high on that. Barbara, I'm sorry. I, I disagree there. 